A sea of humanity is slowly moving through Ukraine in a desperate attempt to flee the war. North of Kyiv is, is as many as 100,000 people. They may be trapped without water or electricity as Russian forces are bombarding the city. More than two million people have already escaped, most of them women and children. George Thomas takes us to the border of Poland and Ukraine, where the greatest refugee crisis since World War II is unfolding. Our destination this morning, the town of Ravaruska, just west of Lviv. The drive normally takes about 30 minutes, but nothing around here is normal. It's taking four to five hours now to reach this border town that straddles Ukraine and Poland. Because of this, hundreds of cars, bumper to bumper, filled with women, children and the elderly fleeing the conflict here. Because we are press, we get through the line fairly quickly, thanks to a Ukrainian military escort. A quarter of a mile from the border, we meet Irina Hadash, standing with so many others in the bitter cold, waiting to cross. The last three days have been the most horrible days of my life. Irina is here with her two children after escaping bombings just south of Kyiv. Ten-year-old Mila is worried about her best friends back home. They are not answering my text messages. The last few days, I have had many terrible emotions. I'm just praying they are okay. But right now, I'm controlling my emotions. Standing a few feet away, Anna Mikitenko and her three children. They were in an underground bunker in Kyiv for a week when she started to notice worrying signs. They kept asking me, Mama, when will this all end? Mama, how long will this go on for? Mama, why is this happening? Anna's daughter, Nastya, also 10, really misses her father. Men who are between 18 and 16 years old cannot leave the country. They have to fight. Alexander Stepaniuk, standing at the last Ukrainian border checkpoint, was overcome by emotion as he watched his wife, two-year-old and nine-year-old, walk across Poland. This is terrible that in the 21st century something like this is happening. How can one man cause so much grief in a big European country? We did nothing to deserve this. The UN says more than a million people so far have escaped from the central and eastern parts of Ukraine. Over 800,000 of them have walked right here through these gates. This is the Ukrainian border and on the other side is Poland. And the future for them remains uncertain. Those unable to walk to the Polish border boarded buses while tearful husbands watched and blew last kisses to loved ones. I really don't want to leave my house, my city and my country. I hope that everything will end and we will return home soon. With her children by her side, Iriana Hadash and a dozen others took their last few steps on Ukrainian soil and walked into an unknown future. I have feelings of despair and fear, but I know I have to fight it to stay strong for my children. George Thomas, CBN News on the Ukraine-Poland border. Well, your heart goes out to those refugees, those families that are being separated, the women and children being forced into exile, becoming refugees, all because of what Russia is doing. And it's just a humanitarian crisis of massive proportion. Well, CBN, Operation Blessing, Orphan's Promise, we're doing something about this. We want to help those in need, and we're doing it in your name. If we can get a map up, we're going to show you where Operation Blessing is going to be staging in Poland. Uh, we're looking at obtaining uh, warehouse facilities so that we can supply large quantities of food and water. That's the primary need of the refugees. We've also uh, been, been informed that uh, baby formula, diapers, uh, those kinds of, of things are an absolute need. So that's where we're going to be locating in Poland. Um, but we've been there, and we've been there with Orphan's Promise now for 20 years, and we, we can see the map. This is the regional map of all the various Orphan Promise 
offices, outreaches happening throughout Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is where Orphan's Promise started uh, 20 years ago. So when we say we're staging in Poland, it's to supply these various centers so that we can handle the refugee crisis. We can support families who are trapped in Ukraine, and we're doing it all in your name. If you want to be a part of this effort, uh, this is a 20-year effort, but right now we need help in order to supply the food, the water, formula, diapers, uh, just the things that people are going to need, and they need them right now. So if you want to be a part of it, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to give to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. Uh, you can write to us, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Just put Disaster Relief Fund in the memo line of your check. You can text us, OB Crisis, to 71777. A giving page will come up. You can also go to CBN.com or uh, OB.org. Uh, either way, do it now. Be a part of it. 1 800 700 7000. Say yes, you can count on me. I want to help in this. This is the biggest crisis Europe has seen since World War II. Uh, we need, we're pre-positioned. We're ready to go, but we need the funds in order to get the supplies uh, that these people so desperately need. So be a part of it. Say yes. 1-800-700-7000. Well, in other news, Ukraine's president is asking America to increase support for his country. Efren Graham has more on that story from the CBN Newsroom. Efren? Gordon, in an exclusive interview with World News Tonight anchor David Muir, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky described Vladimir Putin as a beast with a never-ending appetite. We are a place in Europe, a place of freedom, a zone of freedom, and uh, um, everyone thinks that we are far away from America or Canada. Uh, no, we are this zone of freedom. Then you have to protect us because we will come first, you will come second, because the more this beast will eat, he wants more, more, and more. Ukraine's president also called on the United States Congress to take direct steps to help his country, saying, do it, and I think we'll win. Congressional leaders don't support a no-fly zone over Ukraine because of the risk of widening the war with a nuclear Russia. Still, they reportedly have agreed on legislation banning Russian oil. Democrat West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin calling it a moral imperative. Going on over there and watching women and children being slaughtered, people love freedom and democracy, and we're going to sit back and let that happen. We're supposed to be the defender of freedom. A vote on the bill could come as soon as today. The Associated Press reports President Biden is ready to ban Russian oil imports today. It's a move he's been reluctant to take because of the threat of higher gas prices. And those fears are not unfounded. U.S. gas prices have hit a record high. The national average is now $4.17 a gallon. In California, drivers are paying more than $5 a gallon. Monday, oil prices hit their highest price since 2008, reaching $119 a barrel. It is not just gas and oil prices that are affected by the war either. Russia and Ukraine export about 25 percent of the world's wheat. The impact on production and shipping could double global wheat prices. The United Nations World Food Program warns that could have a catastrophic impact on the world's poorest nations. Now, all this is happening as Americans face the highest inflation in 40 years. That has state and federal lawmakers looking for solutions. Caitlin Burke shows us how Republicans and Democrats have different approaches to providing relief to American consumers. Governors across the country are working to help people with the crushing weight of inflation, even if the fix is only temporary. Lawmakers are very aware that inflation is eroding people's ability to pay. It's making a big difference for people. And uh, a lot of lawmakers see tax policy as a way to address this problem. Some governors are proposing tax rebates of up to $500, while others are looking to eliminate the sales tax on groceries or put a freeze on state gas taxes. 
Jared Walzak with the Tax Foundation says it's a bipartisan effort. Republican lawmakers have been far more likely to focus on income tax cuts. Uh, they talk about the competitive advantage of businesses being able to invest at a lower cost, of driving people into the state rather than out of the state. Uh, Democratic lawmakers have been more likely to focus on sales tax rate reductions and providing relief uh, during consumption. Congress is also working to pass legislation they hope will provide more lasting relief. You know, when I go fill up my gas tank, it's almost five bucks and uh, the price of uh, groceries has gone up. Uh, so this is why we need to put more money in the pockets of the working class. Congressman Ro Khanna told CBN News the Biden administration has a plan and now it's time for Congress to act. I mean, the prescription drug uh, bill would be a big deal to have Medicare negotiate to bring down the cost of prescription drugs. We all know uh, the experience of having to pay too much out of pocket for, for drugs. Uh, the second thing is, again, uh, the earning of tax credit expansion or getting more money in the pockets of uh, working families. Uh, and the, the third thing is uh, looking at some gas tax holiday. Republicans argue that Democrats' spending plans and policies are part of the reason for the soaring prices. They were warned that spending trillions would lead to soaring inflation. They were told that their anti-energy policies would send gas prices to new heights, but they plowed ahead anyway, raising the price at the pump by 50 percent and pushing inflation to a 40-year high. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell says the war in Ukraine could drive inflation even higher. However, the central bank is still planning to move forward with a series of interest rate increases over the next year. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Americans feeling the pinch for sure. Gordon? Uh, Americans are feel, feeling the pinch. Inflation is, is absolutely rampant right now. And whether it's at the fuel pump or at the grocery store, we're all feeling the pinch. Now, what happens to democracies when you get into an inflationary spiral? History is not, uh, 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 it doesn't bode well for our future. Uh, it, it's, it's one of those things where you, you have to look at price controls, you have to have uh, these incredible things that in, in order to bring inflation in, in to heal. But one of the number one things is the U.S. government has to stop printing dollars. Uh, that's been the fuel for this in, inflation. But then on top of it, you look at the energy policies coming out of the current administration. Uh, they're drying up uh, investment in oil and gas right here in America. We were energy independent just a few years ago, and now we're finding we're energy dependent. We need foreign imports in order to supply just our domestic consumption. If you would free up the pipelines, if you would free up oil and gas exploration, uh, you could solve it. But in the current crisis, you're not going to solve it near term. You're paying the price for the policies that were put into place last year. So it, will it take a year to unwind it? Will it take two years to unwind it? Uh, we're going to be feeling this pinch for a long time. Uh, Short-term things aren't going to, to work here. Uh, it has to be a long-term effort. And how is that going to happen in the current political divide? Uh, doesn't bode well for the future of democracy. Well, one of France's largest evangelical churches is named after an American hero. It's also a thriving community center. Any way you look at it, the Martin Luther King Church is a foretaste of heaven. George Thomas traveled to Paris to see firsthand how this church is changing one of Europe's most famous cities. A communist, socialist, and conservative suburb of Paris. A song of reconciliation and unity is rising. And with it, a message that's attracting people from diverse backgrounds. I don't have to build a church. I have to build a place where people will be loved, will be changed by the Holy Spirit and by the power of God. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be, be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream. 
French pastor Yvonne Calluer founded Martin Luther King Church here in Paris's Chrétiel neighborhood after drawing inspiration from the civil rights leader's message of unconditional love. Loving people as they are and don't try to, to make them look like you are, but just love them and introduce them to a God who will change them. Every valley shall be exalted. Like Martin Luther King, Caluer says he too had a dream to create a space where blacks, whites, and people of other racial backgrounds could come together and reflect the diversity of Paris. When God asked me to ministry, he asked me to be a minister in Paris area. So when I came, I realized that more than 50% of the kids in Paris area are, have an, uh, an African dad or mother. So more than 50% of the newborn babies are mixed, and I love it. Caluer's dream is now a reality. We have now like 20% all black, 10% all white, 10% Asian, and 60% cannot be defined. <laughs> Jesus color. And that message of love shared across racial lines has been a unifying force for positive change. This is what I think is the most touching and most extraordinary aspect of this church. Everyone is mixed. All cultures are represented. I've been here since the church first launched, and to see how much it's grown is amazing. The work is enormous, and it's a blessing to many people. MLK is now one of the country's largest evangelical churches, prompting French newspaper Le Monde to call Ivan Caluer a rising figure in France's Protestant movement. MLK, which is about seven miles southeast of Paris, is rather remarkable for its size. You see, in all of France, there are about 2,500 evangelical churches, and the average church has about 100 people. MLK went from 20 17 years ago to over 3,000 people today. Sur ta confession de foi, je te baptise au nom du Père, du Fils et du Saint Esprit. During a recent weekend service, 76 people from different walks of life and racial backgrounds professed faith in Jesus Christ in water baptism. And we haven't seen so much, so many people coming to Jesus like now. God is moving in France like never. Evangelicals make up just 2% of the population here, and their numbers are growing. A recent report found evangelicals becoming a majority within the French Protestant movement. Caluet says the pandemic led to even greater numbers as new people flocked to the church's online services. We already reach more than 30 to 40,000 every week. And when, when you look at Google Analytics, we see what is very good that a lot of non-believers are watching. Because of the growth, Caluer says the church needed a bigger place to meet. So in September 2021, the new Martin Luther King space opened here in the southeastern suburbs of Paris. At a cost of $30 million, a foundation operates it as part church, part community center. And because of its community influence, Pastor Caluer says local government authorities were all too happy to chip in more than $3 million toward the building's fund. That's why we can have money from the state, the government, the, the county, etc. They all give to the foundation. The foundation is the owner of the building and the church rent the building. Church services are held Saturday and Sunday in the building's 1,000-seat auditorium. The rest of the week, it's open to the community for rent. Companies have held fashion shows, car shows, and music concerts. Members of other religious groups have also held their events here. Caluer sees it as a model for people not typically drawn to a church building, per se, to be introduced to the gospel. My goal for me is I want Jewish, Muslim, atheist, uh, political, artist, all of them, they all need to be loved by God. 
to be transformed by the Holy Spirit and to become a loving of each other like Martin Luther King did. In spite of its staunchly secular traditions, Pastor Calluere says God is on the move in France and takes heart in what he's doing in churches like MLK. So now it's really a foretaste of heaven. George Thomas, CBN News, Paris. A foretaste of heaven indeed. That's what happens when we all come together. Uh, you look at the book of Revelation, you look at the gathering in, in heaven, and it's every nation, it's every tribe, it's every tongue, all coming together to sing the song of the Lamb, to worship before him. And we can have a taste of heaven right here every single Sunday if we just say, let's open up, uh, let's include others. Let's love on people. Let's introduce them to a loving God. Let's let them have an experience with the Holy Spirit. Let us all come together in love. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful vision. May his kingdom come. May his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When you see the description of the church in heaven, well, let's have that the same description right here on earth. Terry? The temperature was minus 8 degrees, with the wind chill minus 27. Under those brutal conditions in Beijing, David Weiss brought home the silver in the men's halfpipe. For this three-time Olympic champion, skiing is much more than a sport. To him, it's an act of worship. I've just always loved being off the ground. I've always been a daredevil. Turn it up, let it blast. That's 10-year-old me, what I want to do, I want to be a professional athlete. Like, it was all about the showmanship for me. Growing up, Tahoe area, it was just what we did. I don't remember a time when it wasn't natural to go skiing every single weekend. I grew up in a Christian family. I always looked up to my dad as, as my hero. So my parents' divorce was tough on me. I don't know why it took me so long to realize that my dad wasn't perfect, but when I did, it kind of crushed me. I had to discover, okay, why don't I assess the things that he's told me and see if I believe them for myself? I started reading the Quran and the Book of Mormon and the Apocrypha, and I, I sort of just delved deep into the, all, the, all the other religious texts uh, available to me. And I discovered I was a follower of Christ because that was my identity. The difference in Christianity is Christ came down to us. He loved us enough to sacrifice his life, and that changes the whole dynamic. Uh, I was militant in terms of desiring success. I was training, I was working hard. I had all these new tricks that nobody else could do, but I couldn't seem to land a run to save my life in competition. I couldn't let go. I couldn't just let God control it. And I can remember thinking, God, this isn't part of the plan. Why are you doing this to me? No, no, that's not right. I realized, okay, at the end of the day, this little just bundle of love doesn't care whether I win another competition in my life or not. Same thing with my wife. She doesn't care if I win or lose. She loves me for who I am. She loves me for who God made me to be. For the first time in my life, I was truly just letting it all go and I was skiing just for the Creator. And I was like, honestly, I don't care what the judges think of me. I don't care whether they reward me for what I do or not. I'm doing this for Christ. And that's when I started winning. Once I started living and worshiping through my skiing, uh, I almost couldn't be beaten. It was perfectly timed. It's, it's almost like God wrote the story. All of a sudden I went from this high time into some of the hardest, hardest times of my life personally and some of the least successful years of my career in skiing. My wife's dad died. My sister was hit by a boat and lost her leg. My grandmother died, her grandmother died. One of our youth group students died. All of this sort of difficult stuff happened at once and that translated into me not being very mentally focused when I was skiing. Because people didn't really know what was going on in my life, they just wrote me off. 
and a lot of my sponsors dropped me. I even got to the point where I was like, man, am I gonna keep doing this or is that gonna be the end of the story? I think somewhere in the successful season, I was like, oh, this is for the fame and glory. God was constantly trying to remind me, no, this is your this is your act of worship. This is what you do to worship me. Once I remembered that, I started landing runs again and the timing was good. That was the, the tail end of 2017 going into the 2018 season, getting ready for another Olympics. Uh, my ski came off on my first run. My ski came off on my second run. So I had two throwaway scores. Yeah, I was praying. I was just like, God, what is going on? And what can I do to land this last run? And I just feel like he reminded me, hey, it doesn't matter what these people think of you. It doesn't matter what your result is at the end of the day. You're out here. You're doing this for me. This is your act of worship. One more to go. It's really easy as a professional skier to get caught up in the need for success or to get caught up in money and contracts and you know appearances and all these things. It's really easy to lose sight of why I do this. I'm in this because God made me the way he made me. So I'm constantly trying to remind myself, this is my act of worship. You know, that's true for all of us, isn't it? The way we live our lives, the way we treat others, the way we respond to things is our act of worship as a thank you for the life that God's given us. You know, not all of us get to take home the gold or to be recognized in the kind of ways that David Weiss has been, but all of us have an opportunity to come to the Lord, to worship Him in how we live and to tap into Him when things aren't going the way that we know that uh, God would have them go. You know, God would have somebody gifted like David Weiss do that as a performance for an audience of one. Maybe you're struggling with that in your own life. Maybe you're trying to figure out where, where do I belong? Where do I fit in? How do I utilize the gifts that's God, that God has given me? How do I discover them? If you'd like someone to pray with you today, I want you to know that our prayer lines are always open. Our number's toll free, 1-800-700-7000. There's a friend on the other end who's waiting today for your call. Just call, ask for prayer. You don't have to give them your name. You can be as anonymous as you wanna be, but come close to God. The Bible says when we draw close to Him, He draws close to us. And it's His desire to walk through your life with you, to receive the worship and the praise of how you live. So call today. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. The global death toll from COVID pandemic passed 6 million Monday. Here in America, the total number of those lost to the virus over the past two years could reach 980,000 by the end of this month. As hospitalizations and deaths decline, more U.S. cities and states are dropping mask mandates and vaccine requirements for schools and businesses. The Centers for Disease Control is expressing optimism, but warning Americans to remain cautious. Turning now to Ukraine, there is living proof that love is stronger than war. As thousands of young men rush to enlist in Ukraine's army, one couple decided now is the time to make their eternal vows. The young Christian couple chose to marry in a hurry, just minutes before the groom went off to the front lines. The pastor who performed the ceremony is a military chaplain. He thanked God that even in the middle of war, a beautiful family has been born. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's cbnnews.com. Penelope always felt like she had a hole in her pocket. Money seemed to disappear as soon as she earned it. Then she heard a message on tithing. So Penelope decided to give it a try. The result, a huge financial breakthrough. Meet Penelope LaRosa, the entrepreneur behind Skinny's Instant Lifts. While Penelope runs a successful business today, there was a time when she struggled just to make ends meet. My goal was to have money for gas at that point. That was my big agenda. I worked, I had a good paying job, but I never had any money. 
I mean, it just kind of, it was like I had a, a pocket with a hole in it. And I was just continually in debt. She was $3,000 in the red when she decided to ask God for help. Who better to get counsel from than God? who has the solution to every problem that exists. I started listening to a tape series uh, called Believing You Receive, and it really taught the fundamentals about giving and receiving. Penelope started tithing and praying over her bills, believing that God would provide a way out of her debt. I had a legal right at that point to stand before God and say, I've done everything you asked me to do. Now please do everything you told me you would. Shortly after, she had a conversation with a woman she'd recently met. And she was like, you know what? The Lord's just put it on my heart to pay off your debts. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Penelope kept tithing and was always able to pay her bills. Later, she met and married Nick. He owned and managed a number of rental properties and was a painting contractor with hopes of financial freedom. I've always wanted to be, you know, debt free and be able to help folks. The couple agreed that putting God first would open the door to financial blessings. So by faith, they made tithing a priority in their marriage. They also gave above their tithe. When you're giving, it does something that uh, just defeats the enemy. It really, really does. And um, if you're giving, that's, uh, you know, showing your heart and what you do. The couple dreamed of buying a home in cash and providing a Christian education for their kids. At the time, they didn't earn enough for either of those things, but they continued tithing, giving, and seeking God. Meanwhile, Penelope wanted to see Nick retire from painting. That's when she prayed to God that something would change. Big financial breakthroughs followed. Nick was able to sell his rental properties at a profit, quit painting, and even invest in more rentals. Within two years from when we started believing God to pay cash for our house, we were able to pay cash for a house. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, that's just the Lord's doing. There's no getting around that. And as Penelope prayed that God would provide creative solutions to increase their income even more, she started getting ideas for inventions like Skinny's Instant Lifts. I've heard ladies on the phone crying, thanking her for the product that she invented. Skinny's landed the couple on Shark Tank, immediately increasing their sales by 400%. There's a general, you know, spiritual law there that you give, you know, and it'll be given unto you. As sales and income have continued to skyrocket, they've been able to put their kids through Christian school. And even with the COVID-19 pandemic, 2020 was their best year yet. If you're led by the Spirit of God and you're giving and tithing, that's where your home run comes from. That's when things start flowing and you start getting your breakthroughs. You do what you're supposed to do. God takes care of the rest. What an incredible story, an incredible success story, all because they said, let's count on the principles in the Bible. Let's count on God. Uh, let's give and it will be given unto us. Let's put the law of reciprocity into work that you put it into motion, you give, and then it will be given unto you, and it will be heaped up, pressed down, running over, will be poured into you because you are faithful in your giving. But there's also another um, principle here, and that is you, know, you take a risk. Um, you use the parable of the talents. You use well what you are given, and then even more will be given and you will have an abundance. When the two principles come together, that's when you see the break, breakthroughs. If you wanna start a lifestyle of giving, this isn't some heavenly slot machine, this certainly isn't some get rich quick scheme, but if you are consistent in your giving, then you can count on it. When you ask God for ideas, you ask him for success, you ask him for, the, for um, to use well what you've been given, him to show you what to do. When you put these principles into practice, that's when the increase comes. So if you want to start doing it, give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. Just say, yes, I want to join the 700 Club. When you join the 700 Club, you're a part of everything we're doing around the world. A portion of every gift goes into the work of Operation Blessing. Another portion goes into the work of CBN International to preach the gospel around the world. You're a part of all of it. 
Now, how much is it? Some of you can give at $20 a month. We also have 700 Club Gold at $40 a month, 1,000 Club, $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, do it now. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. When you call, I've got something for you. It's my father's latest book, The Power of the Holy Spirit in You, Understanding the Miraculous Power of God. I want you to have this. It'll guide you how you can get direction in your life from the Holy Spirit. It's yours when you join. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Jerry Graver spent his nights doubled over in excruciating pain. He had already been in the hospital. This bout of agony came from the cure. Jerry said modern medicine was robbing him of his normal life. So he tried a different tact, one that was thousands of years old. The results came back from my doctor and he said, your kidneys are functioning at 7%. This told me if I didn't get a transplant, uh, I would probably die. Jerry Graver has been active and healthy for most of his life. But in late 2013, he started having some concerning health issues, including a swollen abdomen. His wife, Cheryl, remembers their onset. It kept getting worse. He was getting tired. Then he was getting nauseated quite a bit. And then he started vomiting. And uh, he just was very weak. And it just really wouldn't stop. He couldn't eat. So I'm like, we need to call a doctor and get you in. While awaiting the results of a blood test, Jerry endured intense pain and near constant vomiting. A call from their doctor alerted them to how serious his condition was. They said, you need to get Jerry to the hospital as soon as possible. Um, he's in big danger. When we got to the hospital, they took him to the emergency room right away and they said his kidneys were failing and it was just a whirlwind. Things just started happening so fast and he has to have dialysis and our brains were just spinning like, what, how could this happen? Jerry's prostate had swollen shut, blocking urine back up into his kidneys, causing them to fail. He was immediately put on dialysis and soon realized how difficult his life would be. When I had my chest port, you get lightheaded, you get dizzy, someone has to drive you home, and it takes a day to get over it. And then when I started doing home dialysis with a port in my abdomen, you're supposed to be able to sleep through it and, and change your fluid out in the morning. It's so painful, you just don't sleep. It hurt. He would have this machine in his room, and it was noisy at night, and he would just get up in the middle of the night, and he'd just be bent over in excruciating pain, and I would just be crying. I just had to go to another room and pray for him. You know, you didn't want to live like this, and I was, I was getting just really discouraged. I, I, mean, I broke down several times. I, I just didn't, didn't know what to do. I just couldn't believe it was happening. He began researching transplant options and became even more discouraged. The success rate on transplants was somewhere around 60%. And, and there's a lot of guys that get them and they fail and they have to do it again. And, and you have to take uh, anti-rejection drugs so you can't be out in the sunlight. And there's just so many, that's just like you wouldn't have a normal life. It's really hard. I, I was at a loss. I just didn't know what to do. All of a sudden, my normal life is gone. It's hard. As Jerry prayed for an answer, he remembered a story from the book of Daniel where God's servants refused the king's food and only ate raw vegetables and drank water. All of a sudden, it kept going over and over and over in my mind. I think God gave it to me, vegetables to eat and water to drink. And I said, surely it couldn't be that simple. So I told my doctors, I'm gonna go on a vegetables and water diet. And they said, oh, that's ridiculous. You won't get your protein. It has no bearing on you whatsoever. I said, okay, but I'm gonna do it. I was nervous because I'm like, well, you need to follow what the doctors say, you know, I mean, they gave us tons of brochures and literature on here's the things you should eat, here's the things you shouldn't eat for kidneys. And so I was nervous, like, are you sure this is the right thing to do? Because like, you kind of always think you should listen to doctors and what they know. But then he was just adamant about listening to God and his word. For 100 days, Jerry drastically changed his diet. I started on a vegetables and water diet, all raw, all organic and water. Nothing else. No bread, no meat, no cheese, nothing. And slowly, my numbers started getting better. He said, well, a little bit of improvement this week. I said, OK, so I stayed on it. And it kept getting better and better. It wasn't fast, but it was better and better every time I went. I mean, it was just a mundane routine. I tried not to think about it, because I kept getting better and better and better and better. So I was trying to reach a goal. 
how he could do something and be so disciplined for 100 days to do something like that. But he just felt like his life was at stake, and that's what he had to do to get better. It took 100 days for me to get there, but at the end of 100 days, I had normal function. And they, they wouldn't accept it, and they even, the nurse even told me, said, I think we must have misdiagnosed you. Jerry and Cheryl know that it was God who gave him the path to healing and the strength to walk it out. It's easy to say Jesus is all you need, but it's different when Jesus is all you got. He gave me a second chance. And looking back, it's such a simple thing. It just takes discipline. I kept telling myself I'm on, a, I'm on a deserted island and all I got is vegetables and water to eat, so you survive until someone rescues you. After the 100-day diet inspired by the book of Daniel, Jerry was successfully removed from dialysis. His kidney function has been normal for more than seven years. So the first thing he said he wanted to do was go out to Burger King and get a Whopper. I'm like, I'm not sure that's a good idea. You might get sick. But he did, and that's OK. But he got right back onto his fruits and vegetables after that. You don't know how wonderful status quo is till you don't have it. Now I got status quo. We're so, so thankful to, to the Lord for what he did and how he blessed us and just gave him a new life and his life back. I mean, just looking back, I just can't believe it. It was such a journey. And he said, you just grab on those six words, you know, vegetables to eat, water to drink. And I went from facing disaster to a normal life again. Wow. Wow, God. Wow, Jerry. You know, when God speaks to us to hear something that's hard to do like that, something that's going to require discipline, uh, it, it, many, many would not have listened to that word. But God is wanting to do more for us always, wanting to, to heal us, wanting to invade our circumstances and make a difference. And I don't know what word God might give you for your situation, but I know that there are just many, many of you who are so hungry to hear God speak, so hungry to have a change in your circumstances. We know that God heals. We know that He hears your plea, He hears your prayer, He sees your circumstance, and He heals. And so today, we want to join with you. The Bible says when two or more are gathered, He's there in the midst of them. So today, we want to be two of your two or more. <laughs> we want to lift you up before the Lord. We want to hear from God as well, just as, as Jerry heard the, from the Lord. You know, we, God wants us to hear His voice. He wants to speak into the midst of our circumstance. So today, let's pray together. Let's pray that God would move in the middle of your need and that you would know it, that you would see it, and that He would be glorified by what he does. We have some other situations people have written in about. This is Rose who wrote by email. She said, I watched a recorded program of the 700 Club on March the 4th. When prayer time came, Gordon said to touch the place where you need healing. I touched the back of uh, the part of my back that's been in pain for a few days and the pain stopped. When I woke up this morning, no pain. I give all glory to God, and thank you both for praying for people every day on your broadcast. Well, Gordon. here's Virginia from Chicago. She had something like a knot in her throat. She had difficulty swallowing, eating. While watching the show, Virginia heard Terry say, someone, you have some kind of condition where you can hardly eat anything without it coming back up again. But today, your answer is found in Jesus Christ. You are being healed. Well, Virginia believed, was able to swallow the moment Terry finished the word of knowledge. Now, faith is an act. Uh, we, we want to think of it as a noun, but it's, it's an act. It's a verb. And, and you can get all religious about faith and say, okay, I, I, want, you know, I want to drum up faith. Listen to that wonderful story. Of, uh, what an incredible testimony of God's faithfulness. Mm. It's easy to say. Jesus is all, you're, all you need, but it completely turns when Jesus is all you have. So look to him. If you're in a desperate circumstance, just look to him. Don't look at your symptoms. Don't look at your circumstance. Look to the answer 
Look to the author and finisher of your faith. And in an act of faith, looking to him as an act of faith, responding to him as an act of faith. In an act of faith, lay your hand on that area of the body that needs healing. We'll agree. The Bible says when two or more agree touching, it shall be done. So you touch, we'll be your two or more agreeing, and God will do the rest. Lord, we lift everyone to you. And in an act of faith, we lay hands on that area of the body that needs healing. And Terry and I agree with them as they lay hands. We agree touching it now. Anointing of God flow, healing of God come. Be in their bodies now. May they be free from all pain, all infirmity, all disease now. In Jesus' name, be healed. Terry, God's giving you something. Yeah, there's someone, you have the weirdest condition. It's, um, <laughs> I don't know what the base of this is, but your fingernails and your toenails kind of curl up like they've gotten very thin and there's obviously something wrong in your system. God's correcting that right now. You're just going to see it begin to change. Be healed in Jesus' name. And someone else, you have digestive problems. I mean, so much so that you can, you don't even want to eat because it's such an unpleasant experience. You've lost so much weight. God's healing that. You have your hand on your stomach right now. Just receive that warmth that's coming into your stomach as God heals that condition for you in Jesus' name. Um, there's someone you've, you, you've got a problem where your left shoulder is higher than your right shoulder. And I don't know if it's related to curvature of the spine or bone loss or or what, but it's interesting. You're not laying hands on it. It's sort of like you just accepted it. God's calling to you, just as he called to Zacchaeus, come down. May that left shoulder come down, and may everything with your spine, your back, your entire being be made whole now in Jesus' name. Everything realigned. You just felt everything relax, and God is healing you and restoring you now in Jesus' name. Yes, someone else, you have activity like in the frontal lobe of your brain that is causing some um, odd responses in your body. Uh, you've not had any kind of surgery for it, though it's been contemplated, but you're healed right now in Jesus' name. Receive that. There's someone you've had a blow to the back of the head, uh, right where the neck and head join. God's healing that and restoring you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from Philippians. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done.